Robert, what's up, man? What's up? How you doing? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Thank you uh, for doing a second interview with us. A nice follow-up interview. Um, so first off, congratulations on graduating with your master's degree in landscape architecture from USC. Thanks a lot. How does it feel? It feels good and odd, weird to not be so busy, but it feels really good. Yeah, yeah. it feels, uh, you know, I feel like I'm used to being busy all the time. So there's a little bit of downtime that I'm, I'm getting, trying to get used to, you know, not being behind the computer for 16 hours a day. So there's, there's that aspect to it, but it feels good. Awesome. Congratulations Thank again. You. Um, so we interviewed you three years ago, uh, right before you started in the MLA program. And I remember being very impressed with you then. And since that interview, uh, we've become friends, which is really cool. And we've hung out socially. We did some work together um, and have had several great conversations. Um, I'm glad to have you as a friend. And so I'm excited to share your continuing story with the landscape architecture world. And I'm even more excited to interview again in another three years and to see uh, where you are at from there. Um, so let's begin. Let's talk about the differences between the expectations of your academic experiences versus your actual experience at USC. Yeah, I mean, prior to USC, I had that experience of already having my, my MFA. So there was a little bit of kind of understanding what grad school is and knowing, what, knowing a little bit of what to expect. But then since they're completely different fields, um, I felt like I knew more, like I knew what it would be like more so than when I actually got in there. So the pace is a lot different. Um, I felt like I felt like I was a lot more busy than I thought I would be. I thought I would have a little, a little bit more leeway, but it felt like I was always busy. It felt like I was always behind, actually. Like it felt like I was always trying to catch up. I think everybody felt that way, but it did feel like there was this constant like, you know, like right when you get caught up, if you don't stay on top of it, it felt like I would just fall behind again. And, and if you weren't staying on top of it, it would just keep piling and piling. So the idea of, um, of being extra busy all the time was a reality I didn't expect. Yeah. It kind of took over everything. Like I thought I would be able to do school and then also do work and then do other things, but it turned out I just had to like stop everything else and then just focus on, on school, which was, you know, a good thing, but I didn't expect to be that busy. Hmm. Um, can you bring up an example of an expectation that was met with the school? Like you chose USC maybe for a particular reason and they met your expectation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and just going back to, to the first, like just re, like kind of um, expanding on that is that it, there was so much that I learned within being that busy. It's almost like, you learn so much that now that I have stepped back, I can really reflect on all the things that, that I've learned. And just even listening to people talk about stuff, I'm like, oh, I know, I know what they're talking about. You know, I feel like I'm up to speed on things. Um, of course, there's a lot more I need to learn when I actually get in the practice, but I feel like there were a few professors that, like the expectation that did come, that I did get is that I learned a ton. Like. The professors were amazing, which is why I picked USC. I really felt like they had a good, diverse faculty. And um, yeah, I mean, just learning things that, like for instance, there were things I had no idea about. Like, I didn't know what performance was with, like in terms of landscape. I remember when I barely started the program, um, the idea of performative landscapes came up and me being a fine artist, I'm thinking like- A performance perfor piece. Yeah, performance <laughs> sure. art. I'm like, what? Like people performing in the land? Like, sure, what is sure. that, you know? So. So then like really understanding the idea of, of like how landscapes can perform and what that really means and how that's completely different than my own original idea of what that is. Um, there were a lot of things like that that kept happening. Like I have my own idea of what something is and then we'd learn it and be like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Um, so there are, there are many instances where, where that happened. Yeah. Is there anything that didn't meet your expectations? 
Mm, I wouldn't say there wasn't. I didn't. I don't think there's anything that didn't meet my expectations. The one. The one thing that I do. Um, I often think about is that I, I feel like I wish I had a little bit more time to reflect on projects. Like, I feel like, I know that's just the field though. And I, and again, coming from art where you have a long, there's times where you know, you know, two years out that you're gonna be doing something and you can, you can think about it for a long time and, and move a little slower. Um, I do feel like with landscape, I, I had to move quicker and it wasn't, and then it would be that was done and then move on to another thing. Or sometimes there were several things happening at once. So I, I do feel like I, I would have liked to just kind of reflect a little bit more on the things I was doing conceptually, really, you know, because it felt like you often would have to come up with the concept and then just start production, and then, and then it would be like producing and then problem solving from there. And I, I really, I'm used to having a little more more time to kind of conceptualize. I'm curious if that skill set between your experience in fine art and then the pace of landscape architecture. I'm wondering now as a professional, maybe those two will merge where you'll be able to take time to let ideas mature, but yet have an ability to be more decisive in, in a sense because of um, our natural inclination to have billable man hours and be productive. Yeah. So I'm curious if, if that will come through in your fine art at some point. Yeah, yeah, I think it will. I mean, for like, I got offered to do two projects while I was finishing up um, at USC in the last semester. So there were two projects that were kind of a mix between, one of them was like a social justice project in San Diego where me and my collaborator Hector, um, we we were doing something with the city to kind of get them to have more tree planting at one of the parks that's being built for Phase One, and then we got offered to do another project with Crenshaw Dairy Mart, um, this thing called the Abolitionist Pod, and um, I do feel like the skills and experiences that I had as a landscape student came into play for those projects because I was able to think quicker. By this point, I had already started to figure out that like I can't take as much time conceptualizing, that I do have to make choices quicker and and kind of even maybe do research quicker and things like that. And I do feel like that started to show. I, I started to feel more confident as I was wrapping up my my degree, like things started to kind of slip into place and make more sense. Yeah, we talked a lot about in the first interview how we anticipated your art career will influence landscape. And I think it's interesting. I think now we're going to see how your landscape career will influence your art. Um, so it seems like that's already begun and I'm sure it'll continue to happen as we go through, whether it's intentional or not, mm -hmm. there's going to be some, some overlap from there. Is there a particular studio or a particular professor um, that challenged the way that you see the field and maybe even the world? Yeah, I would, I would say that there were, there's two that come to mind. I mean, there were a lot, but there's two that really come to mind is uh, Alex Robinson's, uh, he, I had him for two courses. He was the first studio I had so I always remember going back to the, you know, the critiques and and thinking that the drawings were saying what communicating what they needed to and they just weren't like he and his thing was always like, if you're going to show it, then like it needs to be in the drawing. And that was always a thing. It's like I thought it was there, but now that we're here talking, I realize it's not. And that kept happening. So hearing him always say that you need to go back and, and actually include it there so we understand what's happening. Um, that was a big one. And then also his other course on performative landscapes, um, learning how to diagram, like learning how to do diagrams and pick apart spaces and, and show systems working through diagramming. That was a big, before that class, I didn't really understand how to do that. Um, and then Travis Longcore's class, his, his uh, ecology class was a big eye opener just in terms of um, understanding what's around me a little bit more and like actually knowing what things are called and 
I kind of related to him one time at a meeting with him, and I, I told him how, because, you know, me, I taught, I've, I've taught art for a long time, and I remember my students would come and they would say, like, oh, I can, like, understand what the work is doing now that I've taken your class, and I felt like that was me, like, understanding what the landscape is doing now that I've taken this class. Like, I can go out into nature and, and kind of understand what's going on with the natural systems a little bit more. Before, I didn't, you just go out there and, like, it looks nice, and you kind of pick certain things that you like, but now I can go out there and like analyze the soil or analyze the what's going on with the vegetation and things like that. So under, it, it got me to understand like my surroundings a lot yeah. more. Yeah, you've developed a, a language and a vernacular and um, you, you're going to be able to articulate what you're seeing. And I think what it's also going to happen is you're also going to understand more of what you don't understand. Right, so you have like these fundamentals. You could look at, you could visualize it as a space that's diagrammatic, and then you probably should be in a space where now you realize there's a little bit more that I need to know now. And now that you've graduated and you're going to be starting working in a firm, that should fill in that space, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and then as a designer that will constrict and you'll become tighter from there and then after that then you start getting in probably the business side of things and you know it just it'll be just ongoing growth of of um of your career mm -hmm. which again i'm excited to see in three years where that next realizations and maturity that you that, that you get yeah and i mean even just to add on to that like it it also gave me there's a, a large skill set that i've gained through the program in terms of if I don't know something, I at least know where to look. Like I know, like I, I, I feel very confident in approaching things and be like, I don't know exactly what that is yet, but I know where to go to find it when I need it, you know? So that's a big thing is like understanding that is, is huge because you're not, it's impossible to know everything unless you've been, even if you've been doing it for so many years, there's so much you're not gonna know, but understanding which avenue to take to get there quickly, I think is very important. And especially in our field, there's so many facets. You know, I, I, I can't name a, another field or profession that there's so many channels that you could specialize in, mm -hmm. that it is good to make contacts and build relationships where, um, you know, you could hire them as a consultant just to fill in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, but knowing what questions to ask, I think, is what's important. Yeah. There. Um, did you do any internships or freelance landscape design while you were in school? And if so, what kind of projects did you work on? Yeah, I mean, I did a couple s small projects with you. Um, I did a couple like short internships, mostly residential stuff I was working on, and it was mostly on my end, it was mostly doing um, like the basic things like measuring, doing CAD work, and then sometimes planting pallets, and then also um, like a lot of production work, like 3D, 3D renderings and perspectives and stuff like that. What did you learn from that? I think after the first internship I did, the, the one, the main thing I learned was I got a better sense of how things are done in the real world, um, what doesn't get paid attention to. And then there were a couple things regarding like how long things would take, like how many hours should go into a finalized perspective and how many, like when you should stop, what, what, what should be included for the client. And I think I got really used to working longer hours when I, after I did my internships. Like, before then, I would get kind of tired and have to stand up and maybe take more breaks. But because I was on somebody else's dime, I, like I had to spend the time in the chair and like do the work. And I think after that, I was like, I could I could work all day at this point. Now it didn't phase me anymore after the after the internships. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I've told people that before, and they were like, I don't know if I want to get used to working all the time, you know. And I was like, well, for me, it's it's it made my life a lot easier because now I'm not getting tired sitting down, but I could just keep working, you know. Yeah. And every year you'll become faster. And I think every year you'll also know what not to produce. I think out of school it's very normal to overproduce. And then 
after a while, you know exactly what to produce for the client and no more kind of deal. Because now you're dealing in billable hours. Yeah. Right? Which is totally different than just trying to impress uh, a critique. So it, it, things kind of change a little bit per perspective wise. Mm -hmm. And then I know when you work with me, I was also like, okay, I only have this budget, right? And so um, it's one of the, the realities of like, I'm only willing to pay this much. Now you could work over, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, and you might do that at first to impress, but after a while, you, that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so as a lecturer at Cal Poly Pomona, me, being a lecturer at Cal Poly Pomona, um, the majority of students' questions not pertaining to a studio project typically revolve around how to get an internship during school or how to get a job after graduation. You've recently graduated, and um, what does your future look like now? Well, I just got hired at Surface Design starting you know, next week, is, is that's on the, on the horizon. I've also been doing a lot of freelance projects too that, that relate to my art and landscape careers. And yeah, so that, that's where I'm, where I'm going right now. Um, after I get used to what, what, what working in an office full time is like, I'd like to still continue to do my own art practice and then also have other things going on. It's just my nature to like have many things going on. Um, but of course the job's gonna take precedent before anything and um, yeah, I'd like to just continue learning through the projects and seeing, seeing wh what I can take from all of them and where it's going to go. Um, leaving things very open, like I don't know exactly exactly what I want to do with everything yet, but I want to just know that I want to learn through doing and, and see where it takes me. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good attitude to have. Um, so you signed your contract with Surface. And to me, it's a pretty cool story of how, of how all of that played out. Um, do you mind sharing that story? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, even like, like you mentioned before, looking for an internship and jobs. And I would say that I looked, I always, from when I was younger, looking for work, I remember it being like a very, like I came out of uh, getting my MFA in 2011. And so there were no, there were, there's not a lot of jobs out there for someone with a sculpture background. You know what I mean? So it was like, I got very used to constantly looking for jobs. Even when I had a job, I was constantly looking for more jobs just in case I got laid off or something. Like the idea of not having work is always in the back of my mind back then. And I got used to constantly looking for work. Even when I had jobs, I'm like always looking for something. Um, but then, so that mindset of looking for work is always part of what I do. And wherever there's an avenue, I think even Instagram, there's like, there's places that are always posting that they're hiring. like. If someone's offering like a temp position, I'll apply to that because that could also lead to another temp position in the future or building relationships for something that's more full time. You just never know. Um, I also just keep looking online and, and asking people like when you go out now that we're going to be able to go out more, like go to events and talk to people and just ask. I think I think that's one thing is people forget you can just ask somebody like that's actually how I got my first job when I was 14 years old is I saw this guy cleaning his car out and I was like I knew he cleaned carpet and I just asked him like are you looking for an assistant like I thought he was gonna say no and he hired me and that was like the first job I ever had as like 14 years old cleaning carpet you know what I mean so I found that even then that just asking yeah. is like the first step to getting somewhere because it might come later down the line or it might be right away you know is that how that surface position position open yeah and that, that I would say that you know I feel like First of all, I came through, I had been applying whatever I saw that made sense, I applied to through like all the proper channels, you know, like you send your resume, you send your portfolio, cover letters. Um, and then I finally, I, I started looking around and saying like, these are the places I would like to, I would like to apply to. Like here, like Surface was one of the places that I looked at and I was like, that place, ideally I want to work there. What they do makes a lot of sense for the way that I think. Um, I felt like it was a good fit and then, but they weren't hiring. They didn't have any, like on their website, didn't say they were hiring or anything like that. So I felt like I still wanted to find a way to, to have that move forward, you know? And 
And I, I talked to you and I was like, should I cold email them? Is that like something that people still do? Is that frowned upon? And, and you were like, you should just go for it. You know? So I was like, okay, like it makes sense. I'm just going to email them and get the conversation going, you know? And I did that and I, I let them know I was interested in what they were doing. And it wasn't just like to get a job. It was like, this was a place that I actually was like, I want to work here. And I let that be known in the email and they responded to it. And coincidentally, they were going to be looking for someone very soon. And I just, it was perfect timing. It was like perfect timing for me coming out of school, perfect timing for them to hire someone new. So the dialogue got started and it started off with a simple kind of casual phone call to, you know, the fourth interview with the partners. And, and then now I'm, you know, signed the contract. So it was a, you know, it started off slow and then I had four interviews total in the matter of a week and a half, you know, so a pretty rigorous interview process. Did they recognize your work as an artist? Yeah, I think that was one of the, the main draws was that they liked my, my artwork and my conceptual thinking and, and my, my, um, my ability to craft things and no materials. That must be flattering. Yeah, it was because I, I always thought that that would be something that maybe people thought was interesting, but not interesting enough to hire me. You know, other people told me like you were one of them. You're like, dude, people are going to like that. Other people have told me that. But me, I'm like, I don't know if they're I didn't really think that it would be that big of a deal. You know, I, sure. I think it just comes from me being myself and, and it being so normal. It also just comes with being new in the field and not really understanding what's really appreciated. And that just takes time, right? And after you've been there for a couple years, you might be in the position to hire and your criteria might change. It might not be fine art. There might be something else that you find interesting in the field and you see a young person in school that's insecure about what they're doing mm -hmm. and not thinking it's important and you're like no it is and you let it be known and the cycle continues right yeah so. yeah i think one other thing that i was told that they that was an interesting aspect for them is that i, <clears throat> I always stay busy so like if you were to look at my website like i have all these like fine art projects and then i have music and then you look at my cv and there's like there's always something going on. And I think that that was a big draw for them too. It's like, it's not as if I have to be told to make things or have clients to make things. It's like, I'm always just making stuff in some form or fashion, you know? And I, I think being a self starter in that way was important. And they recognized yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I think that's interesting. Um, so I know that you've gotten into photography and specifically in doing architectural photography. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what you like about it and what you've learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, doing, again, working with you on some of the projects you brought me on. Um, I have been building my photography portfolio related to architecture. I took a couple classes. I, I mean, I've, I, that's the funny thing is I started off in photography, like in 2002 in junior college, my grandfather was a photographer. Um, he did doing like weddings and stuff like that, but legit, like had like a practice. And so that was where my beginnings of my art career started is in photography, but it's always, it, it actually never left. Like even in my sculptural practice, which, which I consider like my primary medium, photography is like a big part of my research practice. Like how I, how I do site analysis. It always has been even before landscape. And so, and I'm always very big on like the photos looking good, even if they're not important. Like even if no one's gonna see them, I'm like, I care about it, you know? So then it, that being brought into- Well, in your retrospective, they'll be shown. Yeah, your yeah, research, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel like um, now taking it more serious, like doing it for clients and architectural work, which is, I've always been interested in architecture. And now that I do landscape, I can pay attention to things differently for the pho photographs. So I feel like it, 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 like doing all these things makes me better at all of them. You sure. know what I mean? So they're all informing each other and I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, and then, and then doing photography on a higher level makes me focus more on like the gear and learn the software better. And so it's just, what and then gear I'll bring, are you using? I use the, uh, the Sony, um, 
A72, right? A72, yeah. and then I also have the, what is it, the A6000? The A6000, yeah. So like those you two? You started out with the A6, and then, uh, and then I think when I got my A7, I was like, dude, you got to get an yeah, A7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then after using the A7 versus the A6000, yeah. like, it's a big difference. It's so, it's so, it's so crazy different. Like yeah. you could feel it when you, when you hold it. It's so, it's, it's so much more quality and the image, everything about it is just way better. Yeah. They're but, both really great cameras. Yeah. I recommend, uh, I recommend those cameras for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, when you were helping me on shoots, it was cool. I felt like sometimes I didn't have enough time to really explain a lot of things just because by nature of shooting outside and chasing the light and having a short period and short period of time in magic hour. Um, but we have gone on, on enough shoots and you've asked, I feel like the right questions. And it seems like now you understand the bracketing and the importance of using a tripod and a shutter release. And, um, and now I'm seeing your work that you're sharing me and it's really good. Cool. <laughs> so thanks. I'm, I'm really happy about that. Yeah. Feels good. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was cool going on the shoots with you too. Cause I feel like I had like I had enough experience in terms of what a good image should look like, but going on the jobs actually filled in a lot of those gaps to like make me confident in being able to do it on my own. Like, because there's a lot of little things that like if you miss enough of those, then that really brings down the quality, you know. So I feel like working with you allowed me to kind of understand what those are and then not really have to think about them so much now. Like they kind of, they're kind of become like just how you do things. And that was a big help because you can feel like you know how to do something until you're actually in charge of doing it. And then you realize like, oh, I, I, I thought I knew how to do this, but now that I'm left to doing it without someone showing me things, like you really have to know what you're doing, you know? So I feel like now I can do that. And I think a lot of that had to do with going yeah. on jobs with you. And, and I think by, like the, the nature of your character is like, you always find the best efficient ways to do things. And then- I you, don't know, you, I think many people do, would man. disagree, man. And, and I don't know, and, but then you show, you well, like to you, show. But... Like you like to show people how to do it. Like, okay. you're not like, oh, I know this way to do it. And then I'm just gonna keep it to myself. But you're like, here's the way that I figured it out. Mm. And based on how you're doing it, I think that you would benefit from doing it this way. And then it, it is the best, the better way, you know? So, well, thanks, I, I mean, I, I'm flattered and I trust, I, you know, I've worked with you long enough where I, I, I'll take that compliment, but it is hard to take because I don't feel that <laughs> way. Yeah. Maybe because yeah. it's through me and, you know, we're always our own worst critics, but uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So thanks. That, that actually means, um, that means a lot. Mm -hmm. So landscape architecture as a whole tries to address a lot of issues such as environmental justice, brownfield restoration, transportation, stormwater capture, aesthetics, so on and so forth, right? We're very diverse and there's lots of um, facets that you could, I guess, master or be interested in. I'm curious if there's a particular cause or facet that is of a particular interest to you right now. Um, and if so, what it is, and how do you see yourself in within that within that uh, within that role? Yeah. Um, well, like I mentioned before, there was that project that we, me and my partner Hector, did um, for the park in San Isidro that had to do with bringing more trees to the park and learning about that was a social justice project for carbon sequestration and. We worked with all kinds of entities and it was the first time I felt like I was working on a big project even though I was only one small part, you know, and I like the feeling of using my design and art skills in a way to to make something better, you know, and I would like to keep doing more of that in the future. Um, also learning about fire was a big thing for me while I was in uh, in my program and my uncle was a fire captain in San Diego. At one point I thought I wanted to be a, a firefighter because I had an in and I thought it would be an interesting job. I ended up not going that route at all, but 
like designing for a wildfire is like something that I'm very interested in. Like, oh, that's on my why own. you text me that you like that episode. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And now yeah. I, the context makes a little more sense. Yeah. And I think there was somebody that you worked with in the past. Um, his name's, I can't pronounce his last name, but Greg. Greg Kochanowski. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He, he like put out a, he did a, like a lecture in a book called The Wild that like has like, that's the thing with when it comes to fire, there's there's not a whole lot out there yet, but he's someone who his book has like all these new, interesting kind of proposed projects and stuff and tons of research that he did. And I feel like that's an avenue that I would like to pursue sometime in the future. But right now I'm more interested in learning just whatever someone throws my way. I just want to I just want to sure. do that and learn and see maybe that might open up new doors for me to be like, I thought I wanted to do this, but yeah, you also don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's a lot I don't know right now. Sure. But one thing that's interesting is that you will be in California, right? Because you're doing a move up north. So inevitably, you will be exposed to fire ladders and learning how to plant that. So I don't think you could quite escape that yet, you know? Um, so I think there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to kind of scratch that that itch in regards to designing fire ladders and understanding those those buffer zones and areas yeah. so um yeah you'll have i think you'll have plenty of time to explore that and i think what's also interesting is that when you work in a firm and you express an interest in something like that you know somebody has to go do those diagrams and do that research and uh, it'll easily fall on your plate because mm -hmm. you'll say that's what I'm interested in. They'll say, "Fantastic, go." Yeah, yeah, and, and and like I know that for a fact. There, there are like three things that I really want to be incorporated in the projects that I'm able to do, even if it's later. Maybe not now because I I still have a lot long way to go. But it's like. The idea of giving people a new experience with design is something that I even liked in my in my art practice is like kind of having having their expectation or them not even understanding something until they get into the space that I've created and then giving them a new experience um, is something that I'm really interested in. And then now with landscape is like doing that. But then how do you do that and give somebody how do you how do you do it like ecologically responsible or so it's like. It's like doing these ecological things, creating new experience, and then, you know, making something just like really un look re unique and amazing, like visually too, you know? So those three things are what I would like to try to encapsulate in, in the work I do. And mm. I don't know if that's possible, because I know that there's, Well, look you know, at James Terrell. Yeah. Right? I mean, it sounds like from what, you, just knowing you, I feel like that's, probably someone that you really admire oh yeah for sure yeah for sure yeah um well hey thank you so much for your time yeah i appreciate it again three years from now i'll fly out to wherever you are yeah and i mean we're friends now we're homies so we're gonna stay in touch anyway so the accessibility is gonna be pretty easy but uh It'll be fun to see where you're at, and um, probably you'll have some more gray <laughs> hair oh, yeah, from dude. being in the office. <laughs> dude, I got more gray hair from like when I started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my master's in landscape sure. to the end, it was yeah. like, it just all of a sudden <laughs> came, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, me as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be fun to see. Do you have any, you know, closing thoughts or, actually, um, this might be a good question to ask now is do you have any advice for somebody that just just got a letter today in the mail saying they got accepted into graduate school what what advice would you give for landscape or, or in general for, for sure landscape oh yeah um well the funny thing is because I, I teach drawing like part-time and always, always have and uh while i was in school i was still teaching and stuff and uh, I actually came across uh, one of my drawing students who said he was taking the class because he was gonna transfer and wanted to apply 
to get his master's in landscape architecture. It's the first student I ever had say, Did you say that. run. I, <laughs> no, well, no, I'm just I, kidding. What, <laughs> what I told him was, um, I was like, hey, you know what? You and I should, you and I should talk. Like we should like, we should talk on the phone, which I never do to students. I never really talk to them on the phone. I was like, after the class is over, you and I should meet on Zoom or a phone call. And like, I would like to talk to you about what, what you should be prepared for because like I said before, there was a lot of things I wasn't, I, was, I had an expectation and it was, it was a lot different because I, I, I want him to be aware that you're gonna work a lot harder than you even think you're gonna have to work, mm -hmm. you know? And so just be prepared, if you're not prepared for that, um, then, you know, you might wanna start getting prepared for that. Right, or mentally you, start. Yeah, sure. and like, let your, let your wife know. If you're married, make sure you let her know, like, and your kids, like, you're gonna be really busy um, and so you should be prepared for that. So don't think it's like normal school where you can like do schoolwork and then the rest of the week is yours. It's like, you're actually gonna really be working quite a lot. So I just wanted him to be mentally prepared for that. Okay. So I would say if, if someone was to contact me with the scenario that you just said, I would say you should absolutely do it because for me it was the, one of the hardest thing I ever did, but the most rewarding thing I ever did. And I would, I would tell that to anybody. I would just let them know that you have to be really willing to, to put it before a lot of other things and not everybody's prepared to do that, you know, so. Yeah, after a couple years in the field, when you feel like, okay, now I, I actually know what I'm doing. Not, that might've sound. No, I know what you okay, mean. Okay, no. yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I should say where you've had years at a firm. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you would want to teach? Oh yeah, I, like I've I've been teaching in some way or another since two thousand and nine. Yeah. Sometimes it was full time. Sometimes it was five schools all over, you know, adjuncting or whatever. And even when I was in school, I always taught one class. Just like I I like teaching. Like I actually. I think it's a big part of just my nature is to show people how to do things. And um, I would, I always want to teach to some capacity. Yeah. It might be nice for you as well to teach something different as well. Um, you know, just because, you know, I've known you for a while now and your demeanor is always um, just cool and calm. And I think that's good for a teacher, not like me. I'm, hyper and emotional <laughs> and I get angry. <laughs> so if any of my students are listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but for you, I feel like you have a natural disposition for that. And it's almost, if you have that, it's almost an obligation to teach, right? You know, and if, and if you like it and now you have like a skill set, it's, I, I do see it as a little bit of an obligation like to pass it on and Maybe even if at first it's not directly at a university, I'm sure there'll be times at your office where you're no longer the new person and you'll have to walk somebody through your graphical standards and everything that firm has established. And I think you'll be really good at that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I feel the same way. I do think that it, it, it is an obligation because I feel like there's been so many instructors in my life that have really um, been there at moments where like it was almost pivotal to have to have met them and um, to set me on the trajectory that I was in and have someone actually like believe you and support you in, in your ideas and uh, I think that that's important to kind of be that person for someone who may be in a moment where they have the potential maybe they don't have anyone else to kind of give them any kind of support or show them that they are good at this thing and it could just be one person that like sets them on that path to like really do something interesting, you know? So, um, and it's really not about what I think I, they should do. It's like letting, showing them that whatever avenue you take, just do that in a serious way, you know? And um, yeah, so I, I do think that's important. And I would say the only thing I, I don't ever want teaching, like I used to do it where it was the only job I had. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it was like the only way that I made a living. I would like it to just be the thing that I do, but I don't ever, I don't think I ever want to do it where it's like my only, I agree. my only job. Like yeah. I, I want to do it where it's still, where it could still remain fun for me. And then I could still have other things going on where it's not what I depend on to make my living. Yeah. I think it's totally fine if you're 
full-time academic, but for me as well, now that I've um, taught a couple years in a row, I don't think that that it would serve me well, and then therefore it wouldn't serve the students well if that's all that I was doing. Um, I suppose if I had a really large research component to my work and I wanted to, you know, be in a space where I could be afforded the opportunity to do a lot of research, I think that would work out well, but it's just not the case. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, um, but more power to the, to, the, to the people who do do that. Yeah. Um, do you, I think this is my last question. Um, are you, do you have any plans of cataloging, cataloging, cataloging? Is that a word? Is yeah. that how you say it? Uh -huh. Cataloging your work as a fine artist? Are you, do you feel like you're in a position now where you could put out like a micro retrospective of the, the fine art that you've done to, to date? I mean, I have like, you know, I've been making work in a serious way since, I don't know, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a ton of stuff that no one will ever see and it should stay that way, but there's a lot. <laughs> I disagree. Lot. <laughs> I think you should show the I work know, right? that you don't want to show. It's actually, I say it lightly, but I, I don't mean it lightly. I do really think it's important to show work that you don't want to be seen because there's going to be other artists out there who are at that stage right. and need to see your bad work. Not that it's bad, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Work that you're not the most or transitional work or however you want to. Yeah, I, I agree that 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 is a, a thing because it, it, it helps like when I, you know, like going back to teaching again, there'll be times where I'll show students that, oh, here's some work that I did when I was at your level or whatever, just so they have an understanding that people don't start, you know, fully developed, you know? Sure. Um, but I do think that I have a lot of work that is out there in the world that I, I, I would like to, I mean, my website is like really my cataloging okay. device. Like I actually use it for myself quite a sure. lot too. Um, I tend not to point people towards it unless they really ask, but um, it's really it's really more for me because I, I look at my website a lot to see like projects that are in that are in process or if I'm developing a series further, I'll go back to the images of it and like see, okay, where can it go? Uh, so for me, it's also a tool for making more work and to develop future projects too, mm. um, as well as cataloging. And I feel like I, I always am kind of trying to balance the idea of how much process do I want to show versus the final the final work and there was a, a there were there was a lot of time where I only wanted to show like I just want to show the perfect thing you know um, which some people argue is the least interesting part. exactly exactly and I would imagine that after going through a degree in landscape architecture you realize there's a whole group of people who are really fascinated by the process, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, and including including myself. Like I, I've always been fascinated with the process, but now I'm also trying to include it more in sure. in the work. Like, <clears throat> and then the cool thing is about process is like you could keep building and building, and building on yeah. the process, right? So, I do think that that is important to show people more of the process now. I don't quite remember, but I do believe I mentioned Jean Claude and Christo in our first interview. Um, now looking back, you know, from your experience in landscape architecture school, do you, um, can you appreciate them in a different, through a different lens? Oh yeah. I mean, I, like, I mean, cause talk about the pr showing your process, yeah. right? That's, that's his whole, th his and her thing, right? Yeah. And then I, I mean, like I've always loved the process of their work it's always been inspiring to me how those become works in themselves but then they become the way that they also fund projects and um yeah for me like i i i feel like learn learning how to do landscape will is allowing me to actually make the process more of an integral part of the project 
where I can make things and show and communicate better with process that I couldn't really do before. Like I'd always been trying to do it. And if, even when I went back into some sketchbooks like a couple weeks ago, I was looking at some of the early drawings I was doing for things and they look like, um, they look like the things I'm doing now with landscape, but just not as clear, not as, not as detailed. There, there's like a lot left out. So I do feel like uh, doing the program, I'm able to then now I can go in and and understand how to communicate ideas better before they're made. You know, one thing I think that artists could really take from architects and landscape architects is our ability to clearly define what it is that we're doing, why we are doing it, what impacts it will have. Because I feel as a fine artist, you are asked to explain a lot of those things, but you're not necessarily held accountable, either internally or externally, and you could get away with that, and mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, but you cannot get away with it with landscape architecture. And, um, and I think it's so valuable to have that skill set to be able to really articulate vertical, horizontal, you know, so many different components of, of how to look at a particular piece. And I think the diagramming, which you seem to be really responding to well, is a, that type of skill set that we have that fine artists can use as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, like one of the, I'm working on a project right now for the La, La Jolla uh, Historical Society. And um, part of it is it's an archive of La Jolla and other parts of San Diego. And part of it is going into their archive and picking things and drawing inspiration from those things that they have that we're interested in and then making a work where the the archive material and then the work that we produce are going to be next to each other and there's like four other artists that are doing it so that's the that's the exhibition and i'm able to like go in there and like i'm i'm researching right now the tory pine because tory pines is in san diego and there's specific people that were instrumental in, you know, making it a, <coughs> like a site of conservation for the, for the Torrey Pine and in Torrey Pines and finding out the uniqueness of that, of that species. And I can go in there and do GIS mapping and I couldn't do that before. Sure. You know, before it was like more surface level. Now I could go in there and like sure. really do stuff that's involved for my practice that I could turn into a book and now there's like way more stuff going on as opposed to just here's the topic I'm interested in, here's some kind of research and then the final thing, but I could start to generate way more detailed kind of drawings for that. Yeah, which is also good, you know, for the marketing component of your work. Um, and then just helping, I think people are, more likely inclined to purchase work if they're part of it, right? And if you're able to walk them through all the phases, then intellectually they get more and more invested, right? And so then they appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. And of course you have this wonderful final piece at the end, whether it's ephemeral or something tangible, um, they're invested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's pretty cool. All right, thank well, you. Yeah, thanks for the second interview. It's awesome as usual. So I'm glad that we can keep this going from the beginning till now the middle and then yeah. see where, like you mentioned, in, in three years where, where, that, where that lands me. Sure. Um, one thing that we forgot to do is have you introduce yourself. So let's go ahead and do that now. So, um, Robert, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Robert Andrade. Um, I am a fine artist, now landscape designer, um, working in various mediums. Um, I'm about to start a, a, a position at Surface Design coming up soon, and I also continue to have a, an art practice 